Hello everybody and welcome back to Mordor Depths of Dejinal. This is Mithril Zenith. I've been really busy with school and everything. Ugh, all my windows are messed up. One moment. Yeah, that's a little bit better. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I haven't made a video since the uh, finishing up of... Uh, Fire Emblem 6, zero base stats. And I've just been so busy with school and everything that I haven't had a chance to even sit down and make one of these. Um, in the meantime, since last I've played, I've tried leveling Wizard a little bit. And then I realized every spell that I want from Wizard, outside of like specifically Displacement, Teleport, and Word of Death, I can get in the Mage class. And I need to level Mage anyway in order to have uh, cheaper heal spells. So that's what I'm doing. That is what I am doing right now. I don't have any quests. Plus it's been fun playing with Mage now and having easy access to a cheap uh, cast of Soul Entrapment. Six, six free casts, actually. So I can just go up and say, hey, I want this monster group and make it mine. Helps if I'm able to spell. Uh, not used to the slight delay. When run recording. Once the spell casts, it actually does delay just a little bit. Uh, such that it makes it if I'm immediately typing right afterwards, sometimes it just types in the wrong order. Doesn't quite pick up my inputs correctly. Oh well, but anyway, what's been going on in my life? That is the real question. I have to make sure I'm not muting myself. Let's pick that up here. Okay, school, work, sleep, school, work, sleep. It's been my life so much. I feel like I'm growing as a person. I feel like I'm learning a lot, but at the same time, it's... I mean, I'm not making content here, so that's... And on one hand, while I would think that, oh, because you're not making content, your channel's not gonna grow. I have had a surprising influx of subs. And the only thing I can pin that on uh, outside of me finishing a series and actually posting, hey, it's done. Uh, the only other thing I can pin it on is that Diablo 1 got a port for digital download on good old games. And I have a video showing exactly how to access Nightmare and Hell difficulty in Diablo 1 for single player because that's not readily available or known. And that video, when I checked it this morning, like, as of, you know, before that released, it was like, you know, one, two hundred views. Got good number, because people are searching for it and whatever. But since, like, as of this morning, that video has over two, has like around, you know, over two thousand, but around two thousand views. And that massive spike of views just kind of happened out of nowhere. <laughs> so, I blame, air quotes blame, uh, good old games for that. Also, I really should have just grabbed that Pelagon. I am not used to having the ability to um, charm monsters. Yeah. So, with that release, as well as the release of Warcraft 1 and 2, it makes it so much easier for me if I ever want to do um, something that I've been thinking of doing, you know, since I started the channel, which is going back and playing through the original Warcraft games, Warcraft and Warcraft 2, and the expansion, because I have... Oh... I never had the original Warcraft. Like, 
disc wise or whatever, but I at least had the discs for Warcraft 2 and its expansion. And those games are. Well, they're old. <laughs> they're groundbreaking for the time. They are not exactly playable now. I mean, they're playable, but they're not exactly easy to get into. But I think that, especially because there's more interest in them now, now that good old games is, you know, put out actual versions of them, that I might actually do an LP of that. Either a playthrough of one of those, or the sadistic part of me wants to do a, a Hell Difficulty Level 1 playthrough of Diablo 1. And... Now, I did one of those on my own time. Uh, I didn't do it well. I made the mistake of choosing Sorcerer, not realizing that in Hell Difficulty, uh, once you start getting down into the caves, you fight what what I can only call trip or trip as what I can only define as triple immunes. What I mean is, there are three types of magic. Fire, lightning, and general magic. And triple immunes are immune to all three kinds. Which means they can only be hurt by physical damage. And since I'm playing as a solo sorcerer, I don't have any way of dealing with them. I can summon a golem that dies in like two hits. Ultimately, I just have to avoid them, run around them, try to kill them with like a bow or something, just try to get them in a stuck in a corner, I guess. I don't know. And you're in the caves, which doesn't really have corners or whatnot, unless you luck out and get a fence and they can't open the fence because the door is blocked by a thing that can't open doors, like an acid beast. Yeah, that run kind of came to a screeching halt. But it was fun. And it got me to really apply all my knowledge of the game from the get-go, because you start out and first of all, it's really fun when you start out because you shoot up in levels so quickly to like around 20-something before it starts uh, calming down. But second of all, because everything is so strong and you just have yourself and you aren't already geared up with a lot of items, you have to make everything count. It really, really becomes difficult and becomes fun. Oh shoot, what am I doing? Why am I casting leprosy on slimes? That's not gonna work. But charming slimes does work. Ooh, this is like wonderful. So good. I think if I end up doing that, well, first of all, I need to double check and make sure I'm able to capture one. Oh, broken level binding already? Wow. Yeah, first of all, I need to make sure I'm able to capture. Offer to join, sure. Uh, second of all, I need to make sure I have the right setup, which might take a while. Because even though I got the digital download version, which runs a little bit better, that means I don't have any of my character save files. I'm wondering if I can just move my character files into that new folder. Where is this taking me? Hmm. Not sure I want to be here. Is there any way out of here? Oh, yes, there is. Okay. Just had to think for a second. It was an interesting teleporter. But yeah, I need to make sure it's like, okay, well, in order to do that, I need to grind up a level 30 uh, multiplayer character. And that wasn't exactly the most fun thing to do. So I totally understand when people are like, 
you know, do I really have to, you know, people posting on my comments on that video, do I really have to get to level 20? Do I really have to do this? And unfortunately, yes. It's not the most fun thing, but it enables you to do some pretty fun things. Yeah, so that's what I think I'm going to be looking into, definitely. I'm not sure when, because I'm super busy, but I'll think about that. I've also been thinking about getting into streaming on YouTube and trying to see how that works, because I've tried, I've tried doing it once or twice on Twitch. Everything goes wrong, and no one watches. <laughs> um, and one of the things I wanted to do was April 20th, Fire Emblem Day. Um, I'd say that because that's literally when... Ooh, Goblin Shamans. Uh, yeah, that is literally the day when Fire Emblem 1 released, as well as like several other Fire Emblem games have released on 420. Ooh, I'm almost full inventory. I need to go back. Uh, I was planning on doing kind of a marathon stream of... <laughs> There's this Fire Emblem game called... What is it called? It's it's a ROM hack. Void's Blitzar Adventure. And in a weird way, I consider that game to be like a love letter to the series. Because it's just a stupid nonsense mashup of everything. And it's wonderful. I still got four inventory slots. Let's do this. Uh, d did everything die? Did all my companions die? Did I trigger a fear trap or something? Huh, I don't have any companions right now. I'd better change that. I guess it makes sense if a slime dies and I'm not carrying the slime back. But not even having any sort of pop-up message was a little bit weird. Uh, let's charm the guards. And fight. Guards aren't great fighters, but at least they have a lot of hit points. <laughs> yeah, so that's something that I'm definitely looking into. I think if I do that, I'll probably play the rogue, because... Fighter's gonna get mauled too much, and Sorcerer has to deal with triple immunes that it can't actually kill. And everyone was scared away. Oh, so let's charm these guys. Unfortunately, bosses are immune to charm spells, so it's not exactly like I can just walk in and do that. And my inventory is full. So, back up to town we go. Yeah, and the rogue just... Honestly, you can do anything as a rogue, so long as you have a good enough bow. <laughs> and enough dexterity and strength to wield it. Oh, I got turned around there. So that's probably what I would do. But yeah, I'm looking into streaming. I'll look into that, see if that's viable. I'll look into... Uh, setting things up for a new series. And eventually I will go back into Fire Emblem and beat Fire Emblem 8 with zero base stats because that's the only one I haven't done yet. And gosh dang it, if I'm not a completionist that needs to complete the tasks that he sets out for himself. Uh, why do I do these things to myself? Five, three, four, three, she said one, thirty, twenty-nine. Hard did twenty-eight on accident. That is so many items. And guild item. Yeah, so many items. Five hundred and forty-eight million gold. My goodness.
Yeah, I am definitely um, doing my final push as Sorcerer. If only because the crest matches so much better with everything I else that I am as an elf. The fire cold electrical res, as opposed to the uh, mind mental res, which I already have natural mind mental res. The free casts of pillar of flame are actually a good spell compared to the free casts of power as a wizard, which are which is a horrible spell. Although I will admit that I do miss having the free casts of of soul entrapment. They are pretty good. It is one of the better spells to just be able to cast at will. Sweet non-chumas are good offensively. Well, it's even better would be to grab like giants or dragons, I think. Demons have pretty good damage output. Uh, let's not even bother with the wraiths. How about that? But yeah, that's what I'm looking into forward for YouTube. Still constantly bouncing around ideas for scripted content, scripted videos. I've written a really brief review of Octopath Traveler. Uh, spoiler for your review. Oh, what was that monster named? Like, I know it was incorrect. I know that it was not what the game displayed as. It was like, you chove... I need to go look back. I thought it was like a Y... Uh, apostrophe J something. That doesn't sound right at all. But yeah, I've... Yeah, made a little bit of a basic review, like a spoiler-free, like, one-minute review for Octopath Traveler, because that game... I've just finished, like, the true final boss of that game, all side quests and everything, and... The game is wonderful, it's glorious. I've heard some people complain that it's grind-heavy, but I'm like, not really. And then I got to the very end of the game for the final boss, and I'm like, okay... I found the one point where I actually need to just sit and grind. Because, like, there are parts in that game where, sure, there's an optional dungeon that's ten levels higher than the area surrounding it. You don't need to do the optional dungeon right as soon as you see it. You can do other things and come back. Instead of just, oh, I see a thing, that means I need to do it now, so let me sit and grind here while I go to it. I, I can see where people are getting that mindset, but that is not the mindset the game is optimally played at. That game asks you to explore, to do quests, just to do things, and enjoy the experience of doing things in the world of uh, Orstressa, I think it was. Yeah. Anyway, it's such a beautiful game. I think I use the word beautiful too much to describe it, but that's what it is. Just the art style, the music, the story, the characters, the teleporting me back here again. Hmm. Well, that was frustrating. Like, I knew it was a teleport trap, but just like, literally chose the one place that's not connected to anything useful to teleport me into. I guess I can get back to where I started pretty easily. And hey, this gives me an excuse to fight the poltergeist. Who's not carrying anything useful. Nesu, Yesu, Screaming Devils, come with me. I'm a paladin, charming devils. Because screw you. I can do what I want. Yeah, that game is beautiful and I love it. The end game was a frustrating grind. Just just that very last bit. But the final boss, just the experience of that, what it was, I would say was worth it because it's so reminiscent of like 
classic like Final Fantasy V against X Death or Final Fantasy VI versus Kefka. It's so good. Dazzle didn't work perfectly. And I am now carrying all my companions. Uh, would you cast the spell when I tell you to cast the spell, please? Thank you. Uh, rotted, rotted, rotted. I just kill these Numenogs. I should be looking for a new thing to charm. Like this right here. Da -da -da. And I'm an idiot and casting leprosy on demons. <laughs> that was very unhelpful. Ooh, shapeshifters. Sure, I'll take you. Yeah, let's not stay down on this floor for too long right now. Companion is broken level, and I could have just partied with them. I'm not thinking very well, am I? Well, companion three broke level binding and then died. So it doesn't really matter then. What are companions looking like right now? I might even just want to have this page open. This seems reasonable. Go. There's something up here too. Gishis. Sure. Same time again. Why not? Yeah. That's. Yeah, so that's something I'm working on. I still constantly have the thought of. You recorded the script for that unit class review. Why are you not making that video? And it just comes down to I hate editing. <laughs> I just hate editing and I need to look for so much footage in order to do that that I'm just not looking forward to it at all. And because I'm not looking forward to it, I've been putting it off. Plus I haven't really had like a ton of time to do it in, so I just haven't really felt the need to. Uh, eventually I'll work my way around to it, but that day is not this day. This day I distract myself between doing essays by playing Mortar. And isn't that what we all want to do? Just play Mortar and not have to think about life? Maybe that's just me. Ooh, I didn't have any shapeshifters in confinement until now. I love the feeling of having a well-stocked confinement. Because whenever you get a quest, you can just pop on in and say, Hey, I'd like one quest monster, please. And doesn't matter. You can just finish your quest right then and there. Road to one billion, I'm over halfway there. Resist fire, resist cold, electrical res, and FEA. <sighs> but yeah, that's that's what the channel's been looking like, what I've been thinking for that. In my own life, I've been reading a lot of philosophy. Some for classes and some for other things. And I've been really fascinated by a lot of it. I think it's interesting how... And the, the term armchair philosopher kind of kind of means something and kind of doesn't. What I mean to say is amateur philosopher, but because the term armchair philosopher kind of implies that most philosophers aren't 
sitting in armchairs at least sometime, thinking about things. Whatever. Anyway, I find that most amateur philosophers, not even most amateur philosophers, most people who aren't interested in philosophy look at, like, hear about philosophy, and the first thing they take away is, oh, it's all just arguments for moral relativism. Why would I want that? And first of all, that's categorically untrue. <laughs> if anything, the more philosophy I read, like actual philosophy, the more convinced I am that moral relativism just is purely a flawed construct. But I guess that's beside the point. Also depends on what philosophers you read, I suppose, because if you're reading, like, uh, Nietzsche, then you come to the conclusion that nothing matters. Maybe you don't, but he does. You don't necessarily have to come to the exact same conclusions that who you're reading came to, but it is easier. And I find that there's a certain attachment that people get to their first, like, philosopher, if, for lack of a better term. In a similar way to, like, there's an attachment that someone gets to for, like, the first game that they really fall in love with in a certain genre. Like, I'll pause it. A theory. I think so many people of my generation, or the generation before me, really, so many people, you know, in the last 10 years, proclaimed their undying love for Final Fantasy VII well, it was because it was the first good RPG they ever played. I remember feeling similar ways about Bravely Default when I first played it. I felt like that was one of the best RPGs I've ever played because it was the first big RPG that I went into totally blind. And really dug into and really just loved myself. Actually, I've played a lot of RPGs, but like that was one of the ones in recent memory of the time that I actually played and exceedingly enjoyed. I think that there is a lot of power to something being a first time for someone. Um, and I think that's why so many people start getting into philosophy and they either discover, and they discover one of the big names. They either discover like Kant, or you know Kant or Nietzsche, or some people might discover like William James or something. And then they kind of just like stick with that and flow with it, and don't really branch out. Not because they don't really want to, but because they've formed such a bond with the first philosopher that they really understand, that they then begin to see like, oh, I finally understand something, and that understanding strengthens a belief in it. It's like, you know, when you very for like, your first love is always your strongest, is what people say. Like, you know, you first love Final Fantasy VII, and that means that you absolutely adore everything that has, like, Cloud or Sephiroth or whatever. Maybe not even that, but you just adore that game because you're so flooded with nostalgia for it because it's... That was the first time that you felt, you know, certain feelings or certain ways about... A video game that was the first time you experienced what a JRPG could be. That was, I mean, obviously from the way I'm talking about it, that was not my experience. I've actually never played Final Fantasy VII. I might play it sometime. It just came out on Switch, so I might look into that. But it's not something that I'm like completely overhyped for. I find a very strong attachment for the first Final Fantasy game. Probably because that one was my first Final Fantasy game as well, and I just loved the way that it worked. Wow, three items. They're all terrible. I guess they're not all terrible, but none of them are rings. Which means they're all pretty terrible. 
I would much rather get like three rings than a cloak, which is probably a, either probably like a gray cloak or white cloak, a cap of visions, and a gem of healing. First of all, one of those items is cursed. But yeah, anyway, philosophy. I've been reading a lot of philosophy for one of my courses. And the things we've covered, Kierkegaard, uh, William James, and now Merleau-Ponty, and they're fascinating. Really dense readings, like, no, I'm not gonna lie, they are exceedingly dense, really hard to, like, get a sense of understanding for. But once you start understanding them, they are truly fascinating, and you can tell that they've really thought through the way things work, to the point of they're even, like, dissecting other philosophers' arguments, and just kind of pointing out, hey, look, that doesn't make sense. Like, Ponty's big point is phenomenology, that life is experienced, not just theorized about. That, for instance, when you look out, like, be best example, like my professor was talking about, you look out, you see a tree. Ask a philosopher what they see, or a scientist what they see, and they're like, oh, well, you know, it's a, a certain shade of green that the light is refracting through, you know, certain chemicals and whatnot, which give off the shade of green of the leaves of the tree. And Ponty just comes in and says, Dude, it's a tree. Yes, there is a lot more going on behind the scenes in order to make that tree into a tree. But as far as human experience is concerned, we're allowed to just say it's a tree. And not only are we allowed to just say it's a tree, but if we don't just say it's a tree, then it starts becoming such an abstraction that we can't even recognize it anymore. He talks about vision. Like eyesight. And about how, you know, if we if we look at something and say, you know, I'm seeing this, that's categorically different than looking at something and say, well, my eyes are working and my eyes are observing this image, which is cast by this thing that exists in a world seen from nowhere. He tears that down, that view down of the world seen from nowhere, and says, look, every view is a view from somewhere. And you have one perception of it, but there are millions of perceptions of it. Like, he says, this house, the house across the door from me, you know, from viewed from where I'm sitting, it's one perspective. From viewed from the other side of the river, that's a different perspective. From viewed from a plane above, that's a different perspective. And all these perspectives portray something about it, but can't necessarily capture everything about it. But do we say these perspectives are therefore inherently wrong? No. Because it's not about... Well, because we understand that all perspectives are inherently you know, perspectives of something. That all perception is perception from somewhere. And that even if something seems to be almost perfect, it is never truly the perfect perception it's just someone's perception that happens to align most closely with what something actually is. What is... And that, sure, we can separate ourselves from that perception, what good does it do us to do that, first of all? 
And second of all, if we do do that, doesn't that just make the rest of our perceptions meaningless? How can we have a meaningful world if everything we do seems just so bent on taking meaning out of it? Instead of asking why, asking for explanation, uh, the idea of phenomenology says that we should ask for description. That the world is there to be described. Not that there isn't any use in explanation, but that explanation shouldn't be the only way in which we see the world. Because explanation is fundamentally only one perspective of the world. Because it's fundamentally limited, we can't... We shouldn't limit ourselves to what it is. I'm sorry if I got off on a bit of a tangent there, but that's... I find it so fascinating to think about. So how many uses do I have on the sash? Probably like one left, two left. Okay. Yeah, I've found this so fascinating as I've been going through. This is obviously the ultra Cliff Notes version of what he was saying, because his argument, uh, he has paragraphs that go on for... Like, he has sentences that go on for like ten lines, he has paragraphs that go on for three pages. And these pages are dense dense pages. Ponty is not an easy read. But it's a fascinating read. And I feel like I've grown so much as a person just from trying to stretch my brain around understanding this. It's really giving me a lot more insight into who I am, into what I actually believe. This, this may not sound like it. It may sound like I'm just saying things and I'm like, oh, well, how has that changed who you are as a person? But but no, it's, it's fundamentally altered my perception of the world because it's made me aware of my perception. It's made me aware of the way that everything is just layered perception from others. And all my minions are dead because I walked in against dragons. But yeah, it makes me aware of these perceptions, and it makes me think of things in ways I wouldn't normally think in. Take the Kanishis. And so, is that... Does that make me a better person somehow? I don't know. I don't necessarily think I'm a better person, but I'm a different person, certainly. And I think that's the biggest growing point that I can hammer home, is that I wish that more people... I wish that more education taught people why learning is important, instead of just being so focused on being prerequisite focused instead of everything boiling down to oh if you want a job you have to get a degree it being like well, you're here to learn so learn why learning is important in the first place and I and what makes me really sad honestly is that so much of the world just doesn't see things in that way I don't know, maybe this is just a pointless rant that I'm giving off here, but... But the most striking things about philosophy, about the ideas of learning itself, are that learning is interesting, learning is fun, learning helps you grow as a person. And... I think people understood that when they made learning, you know, such a requirement for, for the world, you know, when they make, you know, generalized education through high school or through where, whatever in your country. 
that that's why education is such a high mark why so people so many people praise like general education rates general literacy all this type of stuff is because fundamentally we understand that education is a good thing that it improves a person that it makes one better but so many people see education only as a means to an end and at the same time so many people take that mindset of education makes people better and flip it on its head and instead use it to say instead of saying you know i'm becoming a better person saying i they use it as a comparison game i am better than you because i'm more educated than you and i think that's fundamentally a flawed reasoning like that shouldn't be the way we view the world but it is and it frustrates me to no end i don't know maybe this is just a pointless rant anyway this video has been going on for about 40 minutes and i've gotten like five levels maybe i think i started at 89 but yeah i've really enjoyed just talking just <laughs> venting it's been a while since i've made a mortar video and this this feels good feels nice makes me feel happy it makes me feel a little bit fulfilled even if it's not too much even if it's not supremely interesting because i'm still just a person i have needs and desires and i enjoy the things that i do so yeah look forward to whatever my next video is going to be whether it's just another mordor episode whether it's another lp starting out whether i actually put out one of these scripted videos i keep talking about we'll see i don't know finals are probably going to kill me right now but that's fine, because I have three weeks, and then I'll be free for a bit. And until then, this is Mithrasana signing out. Have a great day, everyone.